at the outset allow me to say it's it's a pleasure to be with you i thank god for this opportunity that god in his goodness will allow us to have a, a moment like this in which we will reflect on the goodness of the lord we will hear god speak to us and um, i just want to focus on a few things uh, i must say uh, when i was asked to share with us this morning the number of things that came to mind and uh, I was almost like guided. The topic I was given was me and mine, which, uh, which topic I must say is, uh, is interesting. Me and mine can mean so many things. Uh, but at this point in time, when I was asked to look into it, I have I've looked at it and I have opted out of the topic. Uh, you'll understand reasons why I've opted out of the topic, but I'm still within context. Uh, the focus was to be on uh, relationships. That's what I was asked because I was very clear with, uh, with the team that had asked me and I asked them, what would you want us to talk about? They say, we want you to talk about relationships. Uh, but I, I, I sat down and I, I gave the presentation topic a title, Walking the Tightrope. And when I gave it the title, Walking the Tightrope, I, wa I want you to walk with me. This is a, this is a tightrope. This is a tightrope I, I am looking at. And I may have to really be careful. I, I asked myself one question that I would want you to also reflect on this morning. What is the tightrope in this case that I'm talking about? And... Why do we have to walk it? Can't we just avoid it? So many questions uh, that we have to ponder as we go through today's session. But as we start, let me give a word of prayer as I begin. Loving God, it's never about me. It's all about you. I need you to speak through me to your children. That you may remind us of the things you want us to do that God we may learn from you and God we may trust in you is my prayer in Jesus name amen from the outset I've always asked myself this topic of relationships young people bring about the topic and I, I say relationships is a tightrope topic that Young people like to talk about, they like to, they like to focus on it and uh, would want to hear, but preacher, tell us something about this. And I've always asked myself, why, why do young people love to hear about relationships? If there's one topic that doesn't uh, expire, one topic people don't give up listening to, it's about relationships and how they are supposed to carry out themselves. And, and, and I've always asked myself, why so much interest on relationship? Why is this topic more popular than prophecy? Why is it more popular than salvation? Why is it more popular than stewardship? Why is it that when you have to talk about stewardship, you have to talk about prophecy, you, you, you must give a lot of um, emphasis, a lot of background knowledge. In, in fact, you, you even uh, need to just come and talk. But when it's about relationship, uh, there are several questions that come in. Why does this happen like this? I've always asked myself, why is it that salvation is not given as much interest as relationship? Could it be that salvation is affected by relationship? Could that be? Could it be that many people feel like well, salvation, we quite understand. We need to be saved. And, and somebody sits and says, but I am saved. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. But, but, but preacher, speak present truth to us. Speak on our present issues. Right now, this is what I am going through. It's almost like saying, uh, when you look at uh, a person in prison, somebody is in prison, chained, and, uh, and, and, and jailed in prison, would, would you go and speak to them first about relationships or would you put more focus on salvation and the need to get free deliverance? 
what would be your focus? It, it seems like where the shoe pinches is where the focus mostly goes to. But I tend to think twice. There is a topic like prophecy. You know, people say, well, prophecy addresses future issues and future problems. I would want to know, when will the National Sunday Law come into play? What about the time of Jacob's trouble? But preacher, I am troubled in my present life. So before we go to the time of Jacob's trouble, I am having a little time of trouble right now. So address my present issue. And, and this seems to be an overarching theme in our lives that uh, needs to be addressed. And the desire to address it at times makes us want to compartmentalize uh, each of uh, the issues that we have as gents and as young people. And that's why we would want to one day just speak to us about how do we handle our finances. On another day, we want to hear you speak to us about how do we go about walking this spiritual life. And on another day, we want you to hear you speak to us about how do we walk as uh, social beings in a spiritual world. As, as, as godly children, how do we deal with our social lives? And, and today, I think uh, I, I would want to get directly to the point of how to just deal with our social life. Because uh, it's, it's one thing that affects us. I can tell you, you can fix so many things. If you have money and a wrecked spiritual life, it's, it's bad. If, if, if your social life is wrecked, it's bad. And, and so for that reason, we may need to have all these things in place. The text in Matthew chapter 24, 23, reading from verses 23, says ye tithe woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye tithe of mint anise and cumin and uh, have neglected the weightier matters of the law faith and judgment and and goes ahead and says these things ought ye have done not leaving the others undone there are certain things you, you see the, the child of god must be a complete person the child of god must be perfect and I'm not misusing the word perfect. I'm using the word perfect rightly so. The child of God must be perfect in all spheres. In other words, you perfection is expected of you in your spiritual life. Perfection is expected of you in your social life. Perfection is expected of you in your financial life, in your economic life, in your academic life, in all spheres of life, in your physical life. Perfection is expected of the child of God. And rightly so. We expect a child of God to be perfect because he's a child of God. And, and, and by the way, as a child of God, you can't sit back and argue with us saying, oh, no, please don't put so much pressure on you. Accepting to be a child of God is pressure in itself. Nobody's putting on you pressure. By virtue of fact you, that you ascribed to be a child of God, it means you counted the cost. You say, I am available for scrutiny. You see, being born of the royal blood is in itself a high calling. It means there's so much expected of you. When you see royalty behave in an unbecoming way, the whole world, the focus is on royalty. What happened? What could have been wrong with Princess Diana? What happened to Prince William? Why is Prince Harry behaving this way? Why is Prince Charles behaving this way? Why? Because they are royalty and so much is expected of royalty. You are a child of a king. I am a child of a king. And as a child of a king, there is what is expected of us. There is that which people will sit down and say, this is royalty. They need to behave in a specific way. And so, I, I, against the backdrop of such knowledge, I, I walk into this presentation looking at royalty i am addressing god's children i am addressing somebody whose worth is very high somebody of high net worth to the extent that god will send his only begotten son to go and rescue this person let me tell you something when royalty goes to a place where his life is at risk they must send other people to protect royalty look at the time when prince harry went to afghanistan there was concern why? What if something happens to him? Because he's of royal blood. 
And that's why when we are dealing with God's children in this point in time, we are dealing with royal blood. And I've come to think of it that how we carry out ourselves in our spiritual lives, in our social lives, will clearly designate whether we understand that we are royal blood and we need to carry out ourselves in a distinct way. Deal with the children of God as the children of God. Not as the children of men. Because this is a child of God. Turn with me to the book of Luke. One of the most wonderful texts I, I love reflecting on is Luke chapter 17. In Luke 17, reading from verses, it should be one. Luke 17 from verses 1. This is what Dr. Luke will say, having analyzed everything, he sits back and says in Luke 17, 1, Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible that, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. He says offenses must come. When I look at life, problems must be there. When I look at life, heartbreaks must happen. When I look at life, tough things are going to happen. But woe unto him through whom the offenses come. So here he's saying, listen, there's going to be a problem. But don't be the genesis of that problem. Offenses must come. But woe unto him through whom the offenses come. In fact... As, as I reflect on this, I, I'll, allow me to pick it from uh, simpler versions. I, I, I just want to hear, what does it say about Luke 17? It says, in the message translation, he said to his disciples, hard trials and temptations are bound to come, but too bad for whoever brings them on. Too bad for those who decide to bring them on. So what am I saying? We need to consider if the offenses are coming, if challenges are going to come, too bad for those who are going to cause the challenges to come. Look at what Matthew chapter 18 says. And, and, and Matthew and Luke are, are having this and the principle of repetition deepens impression. And, and why is it twice written? Because it is twice confirmed. Listen to Matthew chapter 18. Reading from verse 6. Ah, no, 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 no. Matthew 18, let's start from verse 3. Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as the little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall be shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom. Whosoever shall receive such a little child in my name receives me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better that a milestone were hanged upon his neck and he was drowned into the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. And that's why now the Bible will say, Wherefore if your hand or your foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for you to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now listen, what God is trying to say is you are my children. There's a high expectation of how you will carry out yourself in your life. So I say walking the tightrope and, and walking this tightrope, we are walking the tightrope of relationships. We are walking the tightrope of social life. And I want to put my point clear. That when we are walking this tightrope, God has an expectation of his children who walk this tightrope. There's a, a, a guy who was called Charles Blodin. Charles Blodin was a famous tightrope walker. Charles Blodin would then go across the Niagara Falls. And, and I did his feet so many times. Went across the Niagara Falls with just a pole. Went across the Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow full of a sack of uh, potatoes. And went across the Niagara Falls 
There's one point in time he went across the Niagara Falls when he was having a stove and he went and midway he prepared omelette on the stove on a tightrope across the Niagara Falls one day while he had gone across to the other side with a wheelbarrow full of a sack of potatoes he asked the people on the other side how many believe that I can go through the Niagara Falls on a tight rope with a wheelbarrow full of a sack. They said, we believe. How many believe I can carry a person while I am going through this? And everyone says, yes, we believe. Then he asked, who is willing to get into the wheelbarrow so that I go across with him? And there was pin drop silence. Well, afterwards, somebody one day gathered courage and went across the Niagara Falls on his back. But that's a story for another day. But it entailed faith to sit on that wheelbarrow and trust that you can go across the Niagara Falls. But let me tell you something. As I walk into this, I want to give us a few points. Nowadays, I think as, as preachers, you get to a point, you preach so many times and, and, and people are like, hey, that, that was a powerful sermon. But what, what did you take from the sermon? As, as, as humbled me to the point, at times I feel like giving people three points to note. It, it makes the sermon easy. You tell them, here are three solid points if you want to live a godly life as a young one. But let me, let me give us a few pointers on social relationships because they affect us as the children of God. Point number one, point to note. I want to call it time. Time, time. Timeliness, time, timelines, time, time, time. Time time is such a big thing. You see, they say every man on planet Earth, rich or poor, have only 24 hours in a day. 24. Even the most intelligent has 24. Even those who teach time management, listen, nobody has ever taught how to expand time. They only teach you how to manage time. Time management can be taught because you, you, you have to see, and let me tell you, what are you managing? You are managing the time when you're alive. You're managing the 24 hours you have, the seven days you have in a week, the 365, 366 you have in a year. That is the time you have to manage. But time, let me tell you, you can argue against time, but there's nothing you can do without time. If you are told it is planting season, you sit down and you do your mathematical calculations and you prove that it doesn't matter. I will plant my trees or I will plant my vegetables in the harvesting season. Go ahead. But you will see what will happen. So time is, is, is a factor that has to be used well. And, and what do I want to say about time? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and reading from verses 1. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1, listen to what the Bible says. And, and this is the wisest man who ever lived. And Ecclesiastes 3, 1, Solomon writes and says, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the sun. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck that which was planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. And listen to this. It says a time to get up and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sue. A time to keep silent, a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So time is an important factor in our spiritual lives as we consider our social lives. Time. That's why for a long time we have heard people advise young people. And I included advice young people. Even when you want to get into relationship, time, time matters. There's a time when it is not profitable for you to run into a relationship. Why? Because there are so many things you cannot be able to handle. So that may not be the right time. It may be the right, listen, 
There's a right time for everything. Just because it is not the right time for this doesn't mean it is not the right time for something else. That's why we say there's a time to speak and a time to keep quiet. Just because we've told you there's a time to keep quiet doesn't mean we don't want you to speak. So listen, when you are going to consider heavy things like relationships, you must always remember that there's time for everything under the sun. There's a time when it is ripe for you to be in a relationship. There's a time when it is ripe for you to just be free. How will you know freedom if you've never been free? How will you know what it means to be single if you've never been single? And, 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 and these are issues I think Adventists suffer with these things. Being single. To the point whereby it, it seems like if you're single you feel like you're cast. You're not cast. It's no more. After all, who was born when they are married? Who was born in a relationship? Nobody was born in a relationship. Came born single. You will die single. And in the new Jerusalem, you will be single. But look, there's time for everything. Since there's time for everything, how do you carry out yourself doing this time for everything? In fact, I would want to put it this way. Remember, you have a purpose as a child of God. If you have a purpose, you must do the right thing at the right time. So ask yourself, is this the right time for this that I am doing? Ah, oh, I know, I know. I was told there's a question and answer session in the afternoon. One of the questions I have had is people are asking, what is the right time for me to get into a relationship? But I always say, one of the right things for us to do as a child of God, rather than ask what is the right time for me to get into a relationship, I may ask myself, what time would God want me to get into this? What time will I be most beneficial as an ambassador of God when I'm in a relationship. Because by virtue of the fact that you're alive, you're in a relationship. You're in a relationship with everything, everything. You relate with everything. You relate with everyone. But again, when we look at social relationships, we must ask ourselves, is this the right time? Let me tell you something about age. You see in the Bible, the Bible will say that they counted the men who were 21 years and above who left Egypt. So everything below 21 years was counted as these are young. 21 years and above were counted as mature. Depending on whichever country it is, in the United States at 16, they start saying now this is getting to adulthood. In Kenya at 18, they say, okay, now you're above 18. But let me tell you something. There's something about time and the things you want to do in life you need to really consider let's go to the book of uh, Luke chapter 14 when I'm still, I'm, I'm still just dealing with the point of time time is this the right time to do this because we need to do everything at the right time it could be the right time for you to accept Jesus lay a strong spiritual foundation in your life but it may not be the right time for you to spend wasting so much time in certain issues. But let me first focus on this. Luke 14. In Luke 14, Dr. Luke, today I'm dealing with doctors. Dr. Luke says in Luke 14, 25, There went a great multitude and he turned with him and he turned and said unto them, What did he say to the multitudes? If any man come to me, and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sister, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then he puts in a principle that applies not only in the spiritual life, but applies almost in every aspect of life. I call it count the cost. He says... For which of you, intending to build a tower, sit not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? And listen to what he says. Lest happily, after he has laid the foundation, he is not able to finish it. And all who behold him begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
in life is such a principle as count the cost. And you see, count the cost applies to your spiritual life. Before you say that I am a Christian, count the cost. There's a song that was sung by a Tanzanian choir called Garama Ya Christo. And, and, and the cost of discipleship, the cost of accepting Jesus as your personal savior. And we need to sit down and count the cost. Because without counting the cost, many of us have gotten to a point in time where we get into things and we don't know whether we really mean it. That's why somebody will sit back and threaten preachers that if you continue like this, I'm going to leave the church. Count the cost before joining the church. The problem why you think you're doing God a favor is because you did count the cost. There are some people who came to church thinking that church is where you come and everything is just supposed to go right because you've come to church. God is not bribing you to come to church. So even as you say count the cost, as we say that, count the cost, it means as a child of God, you must sit down and think, what decision I am making, is it the right decision? It seems like we count the cost. We consider so many things before doing certain things and in critical areas of our lives, we don't consider certain things. In critical areas, you just say, okay, I just want to accept it because anyone is doing it. Count the cost. Lest you start and then you realize you can't. In fact, this is one of the challenges I think as, as young people. Young people, we have this challenge, especially with social relationships. You don't count the cost. You get in and then you feel shortchanged. You should have done your study properly before you got into a relationship. In fact, I, I think it's, it's, it's a good time for me to speak in a sermon like this, of walking the tightrope of social relationships. And, and, and I will need to just say, you need to really think, do you even have the money to sustain a relationship? Do you have the emotional stability to sustain a relationship? Do you have the spiritual fortitude to survive in a relationship? Or you are likely to get yourself into a relationship, then after you find yourself in a relationship, then you realize, um, he says I should not go to church, so I won't go to church. It means you got in without considering your spiritual fortitude. So you sit back and you say, um, he wants me to make phone calls. I don't have the money for credit. But why are you getting into something that you, why did you get to a point whereby you will need credit if you don't have credit? You should have stayed as friends. Friends at times don't even need credit. They only need an update. I am alive. You're alive. count the cost and that affects the timeliness and th that's why I, I i i i always speak to young people i i don't know the age bracket of people i'm speaking to today but if i'm speaking to people from the age of 15 downwards let me start by saying those who are a bit younger uh even ask yourself why get yourself by the way who goes and sits in a form one class when you are a class seven pupil, what are you doing in a form one class? What is a form one doing in a form four class? Those are basic questions I ask myself. Time matters. When you are of the age, you will be able to withstand form four questions, all of them. But when you sit in a form four class, when in actual sense, you are a form one who just joined the other day, you will have a problem. That's why first years should always sit in first years orientation class. You don't go sit in leavers class where sixth years and fifth years are sitting. You will not understand some of the things they're talking about. That's the same thing with social relationships. I've, I've always asked myself, why do young people behave like they're married when they're still just friends? Why do they behave like they're married? Young people, do the right thing at the right time is a spiritual concept. In fact, that's another point I was supposed to get to. 
But let me let me just leave the point of time. As we think about time, I will come back to it. Let me do my point number two, which I want to call honesty. Honesty means in your social life, in your social relationships, mean what you say and say what you mean. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Avoid these flowery pickups that you, you, you borrowed from somewhere. You don't even know what it means and you use it on somebody. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Look at that text in the book of Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew 12, it's, it's, it's a powerful text. It's a powerful text that normally sobers me up. In Matthew 12, reading from verses 36, it says, and But I say unto you that every idle word that a man speaks, he shall give an account thereof in the judgment. For by your words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. Aish, but preacher, what is the relevance of that to us in a session like this? Allow me to say, you see, when a young person, when, when, when I, uh, I don't know how many married people are on the platform. I hope there are some, or will one day listen to this. And I don't know how many who are not married are on the platform. I hope there are many and they are listening. But let me tell you something. You cannot tell your boyfriend, till death do us part. Unless you're planning to commit suicide. You don't tell that to your boyfriend. There are things you cannot tell your boyfriend. That's why I'm saying you mean what you say. Every idol word, even if you want to sound romantic, please be romantic within the sphere of what you're speaking about. That's why in mathematics, one plus one is relevant at a given level of academics. But there is somewhere where you're talking of log to base 10 of 1 plus log to base 10 of 2. Different levels. Both of them are sums. But they're different levels of understanding. And so that's why when I say you mean what you say, it means as a child of God. You know, as a child of God, you should be somebody who can be taken for what they have said. That is honesty. You can be taken for the word that you've said. Because you know you're speaking to a child of God. You're speaking to somebody whom Christ came and died for. Remember the key text that I started with in Luke chapter 17? Woe unto one who will offend these little ones that believe in me. And let me tell you, if you're going to offend a child of God by your words, because you lied to them. At times I say, in, in fact, as, as life continues, young people, let's get to the point of just making it clear. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves you, that I know. And Jesus tells me to love you, that I know. So st stick with Jesus loves me, because it may be easier for you to understand. Don't misuse words like I love you when you don't know really what it means to say I love you. Because somebody may take you seriously, then you will offend the person after one year, and after offending that person, God says it were better that you don't offend these ones who believe in me. Listen to the text. Jesus says, every word, and that's why I say honesty, be honest in your relationships. Speak what you mean. If you don't understand something, just say, I don't understand this thing. Be very honest in your relationships. Whether it's a friendship, whether you are dating, whether it's courtship, whatever level you are, God expects you. It's a high calling. By the way, I've always said in marriage, I am a married man. I only said in marriage, I am representing Christ in this marriage. My wife must see the character of Christ in the way I deal with her. She must be able to see that this, my husband, is guided by God. And that happens and as young people, listen, whoever is your friend, listen, when you are in that friendship, you are representing God. When you are in a relationship, if this is your boyfriend, remember you as the girlfriend is representing God in that relationship. If this is your boyfriend, if this is your girlfriend, remember you as a person, you're representing God. Don't give the wrong representation of God in a relationship. 
Don't make some young person somewhere sit and think that, you know what? God loves fornication. It doesn't matter. God doesn't love it. Don't make somebody sit somewhere and think that, you know what? God loves when people are heartbroken. He doesn't love it. Though the Bible says he came to heal the broken hearted, but he did want them to have heartbreaks. God loves you. God loves the people you relate with. Be honest in your relationships. When we are walking the tightrope, let me tell you, we have friends. And one of the things I will tell you as a friend, be honest. I've, I've, I've struggled with this issue of honesty. Because at times, at times it, it looks difficult to be honest. Because at times when you're honest, you disappoint people. But let me tell you, be honest anyhow. I'd rather you are honest with me and you tell me the truth than be dishonest to massage my ego. Then after two days, I realize you didn't actually mean what you were saying. You're just trying to put me into shape. Be honest. That's why I said count the cost. And Jesus wants you to count the cost. Let me give you a third point. Be principled. Before you get into any relationship, any, anything, relationship, friendship, be principled. That is one thing that God wants us to have. Look at the character called Joseph. Ah, You know, before you find yourself into Potiphar's house, you must know what you will say when Potiphar's wife comes. I've, I've always asked myself, look at this young man, tempted, but he knew how to respond to the temptation. Be principled. Principle means you can sit down and you can say, this is what I believe in. You can be able to stand for yourself and speak for yourself. Don't say this is what FOC believes in. There is the what FOC believes in. There is what you believe in. There is what SDS believe in. But what do you believe in? Ah, you know the story. Matthew, I, I, I think it's Matthew. It should be chapter, is, is it 13? where Jesus is, is speaking, and the Bible says when he came to the course of Caesarea Philippi, they asked, Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say you are this, some say you are this. But Jesus asked, but whom do you say I am? Don't tell me what people say I am, because people can speak, and people say this, people say this, people say that, but whom do you say I am? So Jesus wants you to give a personal testimony of the walk with him. Be principled. Being principled means you stand for something. You know those powerful quotes for motivation, he who does not stand for anything will fall for everything. Be principled. It means as a child of God, you can say as they said, as for me and my house, we will worship God. If you are not principled, no matter what relationships you get into, you are not going to represent God well because you are not principled. A principled person knows why they do what they do. A principled person does not do something just because they lack opportunity to do it. They do something because I know this is what I have believed in and this is what God wants me to do. That's a principled person. And that's why God wants his children to be principled. That his children can stand up and say, I'm getting into this relationship, but these are my principles. Point number one, I don't go back home late. Principle. I have curfew, my own personal curfew. Point number two, my body is the temple of the Lord. So when you are getting here, remember, this is the temple of the Lord. You don't mishandle vessels in the temple of the Lord. Do you remember what happened to Belshazzar? 
Hey, ladies who are in the congregation, just listen to me because you need to remind men are the ones who really like misbehaving with vessels. You remember what happened to Belshazzar? If you remember what happened to Belshazzar when he tried mishandling vessels from the temple of the Lord, you remember how he was beaten? Remember, this is the temple of the Lord. So as a child of God, you must be principled. And by the way, this thing, it, it cuts across board. It's not for social relationships only. Even before you go into school, you must know, I am a child of God. I don't do one, two, three, four. Because I am a child of God. By the way, there are certain things that are principled. If principles, if people ask you, you should be willing to tell them that you know what? This is me. This is now what defines me. You saw me, you thought of me, but what defines me is these principles. I always say you must know the rules of the game before you start playing the game. You don't come into a football pitch. Then you pick the football with your hand. That's a handball. You must know the rules of the game. And that's why you have to be principled before. And that's why when, when you're saying bad company corrupts good morals, we are talking about the children of God must have good friends. But you must have principles. They will guide you in choosing your friends. Not only in your relationship, but even in choosing your friends. And that's why, as a child of God, choose for yourself this day. What are you standing for? You see, principles, one of the things about principles is, principles will guide how you walk as a child of God, because you're representing God. That's why you can confidently stand and say, I ain't doing this on Sabbath because I worship the God of the Sabbath. Understand it. Not because my mama told me when I was growing up, that on Sabbath, you don't always do this. Principles. But let me tell you something else. Another point I want to speak about is... Mm, when I was younger than this, I remember in our house, we used to have enamel, glassware, and we used to have plastic utensils. You knew you were a grown-up when your food is served in glassware. You knew you were a child when your food is still served in plastic cups. Listen to me, listen to me. Why? There is something that they used to write on glassware. They used to write fragile items, handle with care. Keep out of reach of children. Because children did not know how to handle glassware. Children were experts in, uh, what is it called? Plastic. Because you see, a plastic mug, you can throw it down when you have tantrums and we understand. But as an adult, we expect when you have tantrums, you don't throw mugs down. You control yourself. That's why you will be allowed to have this. Why? Because this one, it's known that an adult knows that if I throw this down, it's going to break. A kid doesn't understand that. But I will tell you something. In social lives, children of God, listen to this. Listen to this. Ah, no. Let's put a text to it. I know you'll be like, but preacher, you're just telling us what you are when you're growing up. What if you are still growing? So let me just put a text to it for those who are afraid that the preacher may still be growing. Now listen to this. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verses 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but I am become a man. I put away childish things. The other day I was invited to speak to gents. And, and being a gents week of spiritual emphasis, let me tell you something. There's a man and there's a child. 
And please, if you're behaving like a child, never force me to call you a man. I will call you what you present. If you present childish behavior, we call you a child. We are not demeaning you. We are telling you what you are. Let me tell you. When you, when you say that this is black, you're not abusing this thing. You're not a racist. It is black. In fact, calling this mug to be white is a lie. Just being a liar, you're, you, 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 you're not being polite. It's a black mug. So what you present is what we tell you. When you see some young boy somewhere, he's a cheat, heartbreaking ladies left, front, right, and everywhere, and we, we say you're a player, we are telling you what you've exhibited to us. Don't tell me, don't judge me. We are not judging you. We are explaining to you what you've presented. There's a problem with life. You present childish behaviors, then you want to be called a man. It doesn't happen like that. Present manliness. Even if you're a young boy, we will say there is manhood in this young boy. But prevent, present to us childish behavior. We will always remind you, you're a child. It, it, it may be that the child in you is, is, is camouflaged. And, 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 and is hidden inside a big volume of mass, uh, 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 inside a big mass. And, and we, we admit, the mass is big, but there is a child. But behave well. And that's why it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Aish, young man, listen to me. How do you speak? From your speaking, we can identify you are either childish or not. How do you behave? Do you know how to handle fragile items? You know, you, you live at a point in time where you meet 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds who are arguing about getting into relationships and they don't know how to handle fragile items. If, if you don't know how to handle fragile items, humble yourself. Deal with plastic. Just, just handle yourself. Yourself is easy to handle. Rather than go handle people whom you can't handle. I've always said, prove your worth before you ask people to respect you. Show that you're worth that honor. And why am I, why am I putting it like this? I'm putting it like this because there are even some young adults grown they are past the age of being called young ones cleared campus everything in fact they are like the fig tree that jesus looked when he beheld the fig tree presented much foliage too many leaves but no fruit so here you are very old sop quoting and everything with which there is nothing wrong but the way you are carrying out yourself you're behaving like a child who memorized verses now these children are challenging us by the way because if, if a child can memorize psalm 23 what's the difference between you who has memorized psalm 23 and the child who has memorized psalm 23 let's behave like adults who have psalm 23 you, you see the difference between you and the child should be that psalm 23 has done something in your heart and the way you carry out yourself looks different Otherwise, children ministries department may be having vacancies. Eish, but preacher, we didn't call you on this. You're walking on the tightrope. Yes, I'm walking on the tightrope. I'm walking on the tightrope because we need men who are having substance. Men who have grown in Christ. Men who have spent time with Christ. And that's why I say, if you spend time with Christ... He will tell you how to handle other people. Because let me tell you, there's, there's such a thing as spiritual disappointment, as uh, breakups. Nothing is more painful as God's children breaking up. I think it's painful. When you're heartbroken by 
somebody who is not a Christian, who is not a child of God, you say, but, but what was I expecting? After all, this one, this one, I wasn't expecting much. In fact, I'm even shocked that he was able to handle it well. That's what happens when you are disappointed by one who is not a child of God. But when a child of God disappoints you in a social life, I have seen friends who are on the verge of leaving the church because they were disappointed by a friend in a social relationship. And they ask, how? How can it happen? This guy is a preacher. How can a preacher do such a thing? So preachers, let's spend time with Jesus. Choristers, choir directors, music trainers, let's spend time with Jesus. Church members, church goers, let's spend time with Jesus. Then we'll be able to walk the tightrope of social relationship and know how to handle people. But then I'll tell you something. It's not a knowledge of the end times that is worrying us. It's a knowledge of how to handle people in the end times that I think is worrying us. Because we know we are living in the last days. We can tell you with, with, with the precision of statistical evidence that we are living in the last days. We can even prove to you that COVID is one of the pestilences spoken of in Matthew 24. That one you know and you believe. But the question is, preacher, preacher, can you speak to us something about these last days and how relationships should be in the last days? Seems like everyone is waiting for Jesus, but they don't know how to handle other people who are waiting for Jesus. So yes, you're waiting for Jesus, but here you are breaking other people who are also waiting for Jesus to the extent they can't pay attention to waiting for Jesus. I've asked myself, why is it that when I was younger than this, we used not to have much problems with uh, relationships? Well, the problems were there. The problems were there. Even when Solomon says that one of the things I don't understand is the way of a man and a woman, how a man and a woman behave, I don't understand. Even Solomon said that. He doesn't understand. How do you expect me to understand it? But let me tell you, even when he says that, there is one thing that is dead sure about, that the children of God need to carry out themselves well when they are doing these things. Because it's affecting your spiritual life. And seriously for that matter. When a child of God does not represent God in this kind of a relationship, it's affecting your spiritual life. And I said, my fourth point, young man, you need to know how to handle fragile items. And how will you know how to handle fragile items? Spend time with Jesus. He will teach you how to deal with the children. Hmm. Anyway, let me finish. I'm seeing time is not on my side. Before you get into a social relationship, before you get into your relationships that you want to get into, have a vision. Know where you are headed. The biggest problem is starting a course that you don't know what it will lead to. I don't know about you, but one of the things I was doing when I was selecting electrical engineering for a course is I wanted to know what is the end product of electrical engineering. You don't sit back and say, okay, which course is there? Can I just do it? Check. What are the prospects at the end of this course? Don't start a journey whose end you don't see. That, oh, let's just get into a relationship. We will grow as we go on. No, where do you want to end with this? How many of you go to the stage and then you board any matatu? You say, okay, as long as it takes me somewhere. You must know. I'm going to Kitengela. I board a vehicle going to Kitengela. If it breaks on the way, you are headed to Kitengela. So you say, okay. I did arrive at Kitengela. I boarded the vehicle. I didn't need to love a puncher. But you can't just say that, okay, let's get into a relationship for the sake of it. No. You must have a vision. 
when you're doing these things. I think one of the reasons we have so many challenges is we, we, we don't sit down to ask the vision. By the way, why is it, and I, I think this is a right forum to ask, why is it when you go to the university, you're given a course outline, you want to know what are the modules I will do this semester. You want to know what are the units I am scheduled to do. But in a relationship, people just want to jump in and they want the modules to come as the months go by. It doesn't happen like that. When you are starting, know where you are heading. It will help you to live a godly life. Because you know I am starting this. And this is what I am visualizing in the next two years. I is like listening to this as you talk about it. There are 18-year-olds and 17-year-olds who are in a relationship. The elders, the parents, the pastors, the preachers will tell you, 18-year-olds, don't get into a relationship. It's a waste of time. But you'll say, but, but what do you mean? So, pastors sit and they don't know how to walk around with you. But, but I will tell you, what's your vision? At 18 years, you're getting into a relationship, and a serious one for that matter. You even cannot sleep without talking to each other. How many sleepless nights are you planning to have? You are 18. You are planning to get married at 28. That is 10 years of sleepless nights. 10 solid years of sleepless nights. It's tough. It's tough. And, and so as, as, as we consider this, as, as we look at this, it, it's something that I would want to ask us that we may need to consider and tell ourselves, what is my plan? What am I planning to do even as I start this? As, as I get into this, what is my focus at the end of it? Remember, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that's why you will sit down and ask, where am I headed? So have a vision. I wish as we end this, somebody would get from here and sit down and write, this is my vision. I'm, I'm not saying vision 2030, vision 2020, vision 2024, I must have a girlfriend. No, just know if I am to get into any relationship, I want to know what it leads to. You, you don't get into a relationship as if you're gaining experience that you know what preacher... Uh, what is your vision for getting into this relationship? I want to gain experience. I want to know what it means to be in a relationship. Ask us what it means. We will tell you free of charge. Or else you're going to at break somebody tomorrow because you are there gaining experience. When somebody was there, serious about life. That's why you see so many people are complaining about Adventist young men. Oh, preacher, finish now. Let me finish. Let me finish with this. There are so many complaints about Adventist young men. And why do we have these complaints? Because it seems like the Adventist young ladies feel like these people lack focus. When we tell you you lack focus, you say, but, but preacher, why are you abusing us on, on public media? No, it's not abusing anyone. I'm, I'm just saying at times you, you, it's, it's a general thing. It looks like there's lack of focus, a general lack of focus. Which means, man, we need to cock us back and, and look for where did we lose the focus. I've always said a real man does not blame a lady for the mistakes he has done. And they say, oh, this lady made me do it. No. You help the lady to stop doing that which is wrong or you run away. Two things. You can say, I couldn't help it. I don't know what happened. It just happened like that. It doesn't happen like that with real men. A child of God understands that to be a real man, you either run away or do the right thing. You can't sit with temptation and argue and say, the woman you gave me. So, some of the ladies you even want to blame are not the woman God gave you. They are the women you went to look for. Then here you are blaming God. I don't know what happened. You must know what happened. 
And that's why I said be principal. I said time. Consider what time to do what things. Number two, I said be honest with yourself and with your friends. Be honest. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Number three, I said be principled. Before you get into any relationship, you must know this is what I believe in. This is what I stand for. And when you are coming, when I'm getting into a relationship with you, you must know what I stand for and you must ascribe to what I stand for. Number four, I said handle fragile items with care. You are dealing with the heart of a child of God. That thing is delicate. Handle it with care. If ever you find yourself in a relationship, just know you are dealing with the heart of a child of God. Joke with that heart and God will beat you thoroughly. Because he says it were better for you that a milestone was hung upon your neck and you are cast into the depth of the sea. And number four, number five, sorry. Have a vision. Know where you are heading. And if you know where you are heading, God will help you to get where you are heading. So pray about where you are heading. If, if you plan to get married in five years' time, start praying about it five years before. If you plan to be single for life, start praying about it. Ask God, God, give me the gift to handle being single because people will ask me many questions and I want to be single. Ask God to give you that gift. But in everything, give thanks to the Lord. Just learn to walk with God. Remember, as I close, you are the ambassadors of Christ. How you carry out yourself will make somebody either believe in God, love God, or will make somebody fail to trust in God and leave God completely. I know of many a young girl who have decided I am not getting into a relationship anymore. Why? If an Adventist could do that to me, I don't want to be heartbroken anymore. Imagine. And here we are. Having relationship seminars after relationship seminars after relationship seminars. Beloved, let me tell you something. Relationship seminars are not emotional massage sessions. Some of us attend these things, but they don't want to change their habits. I wish I would change my topic. Because we cannot be asking the same questions over and over again. Is it right to date an unbeliever? So you asked me that last year. You're asking me that this year. Are you testing me as a preacher? Are you testing whether I have changed? It will not change. So here you are. You are calling for Maxwell and you are asking Chief. And, and you want to check. Will Chief say a different thing from what Maxwell say? Will Chief allow us to start dating at a tender age? Beloved, it's, it's, it's not. Don't look for that. Ask what is the right thing. And do the right thing. And that's what I'm seeking to get us to. We are walking a tight rope. And this tightrope, we really need to be careful. Because it is tough. It's tough. Don't get to the tightrope if you are not sure that you can be able to walk it. Walk the smooth roads. Walk on the pavements. That's where you are fond of. And as I said, until you grow up for the tightrope walking, stay on the pavements. You can run there. Don't go carrying somebody's daughter on your back on the tightrope. And after you've carried somebody's daughter on your back on the tightrope, you leave them to fall down the Niagara because you are saving yourself. It's dangerous. It's bad. It's not good. And so, as we go through these things, I love talking to young people about relationships because relationships affect our spiritual lives. And I'll tell you something. Don't say, oh, but did you hear even the preacher said when you are at broken, you feel like leaving church. Don't leave church. I said you feel like, but I didn't say you have to. I'm saying that because I don't want you at broken. I want them to know that when they at break you, they can push you to the near deep end. But I don't say that because I want you to say, but you heard, that's why I'm leaving. No. And that's why I said, be principled. You came to this church because of Jesus. You did not come to this church because of the boys and the girls in this church. Boys and the girls will disappoint you. So trust in Jesus first. If somebody is going to trust in you, let them pass through Jesus. Ask them, have you, have you said hi to Jesus? 
Hey, you're not saying hi to me if you've not high-fived Jesus. You must spend time with Jesus before coming here. That's a principle you must have as a child of God. And if they say, let's bypass Jesus, let them bypass. Let them, let them, let them go. If they can't go through Jesus, hey, beloved, which, which memory verses do you want to commit to memory? Preacher, leave us with one. Yes, let me leave you with one memory verse. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So tell them, no guy comes to me but through Jesus. No lady comes to me but through Jesus. Tell them, go be assessed by Jesus so that tomorrow when I am crying to Jesus that I am at broken, I can tell Jesus that, Jesus, look at, look at what your daughter has done to me. Deal with your daughter. Because God, I asked you for your daughter. You gave me your daughter. Now look at how I'm suffering because I took your daughter. Some of us are picking the sons and daughters of the devil himself. Then now we come and cry to Jesus. But Jesus, look at what the hypocrite did to me. Why did you choose a hypocrite? Let's ask God. God, give me that spiritual discernment that I may spend time with you and those who are going to come into my life and have an impact on my life. Let it be that they've passed through you. Let me finish with that. Let me tell you something. If you are at broken by a child of God, children of God even know how to at break people. They don't just drop you there. A child of God handles you with care. Doesn't at break you on WhatsApp. A child of God even invests when they are going to outbreak you. They, they, they sit you down. They, they talk to you. They prepare your heart. They, they make you understand. Even me, I am finding it difficult to outbreak you. Leave these ones. It's hypocrites who just drop SMSs like that. But a child of God, you spend your time. You know it's difficult. You call the person. You meet. You even foot the bill. Because you are the one going to bring a big problem. You even foot the bill. You allow somebody to eat. So that, you know, heartbreaks will make somebody lose appetite. So allow them to eat first. After they've eaten, then you say, you know, I've considered it. having spoken to God. And, and they must know that you always speak to God beforehand. So I won't tell them I've spoken to God. And, and I think this is the right decision for us to take. This relationship is not helping you. It's not helping me to go heavenward. So we are, going to, we, we are going to stop this relationship. But don't worry. It's not going to be that bad. We are going to ask God to help us go through it. But here you are. You're saying it's over. Then you switch off your phone. You're behaving like the devil himself. You're killing people's dreams and hurting people. Let me end at that point. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. We'll have some time in the afternoon. Let me not finish everything right now. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving God. It's a tightrope. It's tight. And this tightrope of relationships. We want to walk with you. We want you to go with us. God, that you may guide us to do that which is right. That you may guide us so that when the time comes for those whom it is not yet, or those who are going through it, that we may be able to know how to walk the tightrope of relationship. That we may be able to do that which is right. God, help us to do the right things at the right time. Help us to speak what we mean and mean what we speak. God, help us that we may be principled as we get into our relationships, as we go through our relationship, we may have godly principles. God, help us that we may know how to handle fragile items. God, we are handling your children. Teach us how to handle your children. And God, please, help us have a vision when we start our spiritual, our physical, our emotional projects. Help us to have a vision that we may know where we want to get. God, help us that in everything, we may give thanks to you and give glory to you. And those who see us may know that the children of God do things in a godly way. Bless us now and always as I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and God keep you all safe. Amen.